Dead Man's Dust by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Scotty Smith You don't buy poetry. Neither do I. Why? You cannot afford it? Bosh! You spend a dition deluxe on a thirsty friend. You can buy any one of the poetry bunch for the price you pay for a business lunch. Don't you suppose that a hungry head, like an empty stomach, ought to be fed? Looking into myself, I find this true, so I hardly can figure it false in you. And you don't read poetry very much. Such is my own case also. But, you cry, I haven't the time. Beloved, you lie. When a scandal happens in Buffalo, you ponder the details, con and pro. If poets were pugilists, couldn't you tell which of the poets licked John L.? If poets were counts, could your wife be fooled as to which of the poets married a gould? And even my books might have some hope, if poetry books were books of dope. You're a little bit swift, you say to me. See, you open your library, then you show your favorite poets, row on row, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Tennyson, Poe, a Homer unread, an uncut Horace, a wholly forgotten William Morris. My friend, my friend, can it be you thought that these were poets whom you had bought? These are dead men's bones. You bought their mummies to display your style like clothing dummies. But when do they talk to you? Someone said that these were poets which should be read, so here they stand. But tell me, pray, how many poets who live today have you of your own volition sought, discovered, tested, proved, and bought? With a grateful glow that the dollar you spent netted the poet his ten per cent. But hold on, you say. I'm reading you. True and pitying too the sorry end of the dog i tried this on my friend i can write poetry good enough so you wouldn't look at the worthy stuff but knowing what you prefer to read i'm setting the pace at about your speed being rather convinced these truths will hold you a little bit better than if i told you a genuine poem and forgotten to scold you besides when i open my little room and see my poets, each in his tomb, with his mouth dust stopped, I turn from the shelf, and I must scold you, or scold myself. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In 1900 and Now by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway, 29th of November, 2016, Kent. Thomas More, at the present date, is chiefly known as a ten cent straight. Walter the Scot is forgiven his rhymes because of his tales of stirring times. William Morris's fame will wear as a practical man who made a chair. And even Shakespeare's memory's green, less because he's read than because he's seen. Then why should a poet make his bow in the year of 1900 and now? Homer himself, if he could speak, would admit that most of his stuff is Greek. Chaucer would no doubt own his tongue, was the broken speech of the land when young. Shelley is a sealed-up book, and Byron is chiefly recalled as a masculine siren. Poe has a perch on the chamber door, but the populace read him nevermore. Spencer's fitted his day as all allow, but this is 1900 and now. Tennyson's chiefly given away to callow girls or commencement day. Alfred Austin, entirely solemn, is quoted most in the funny column. Riley's Hoosiers have made their pile and moved the city to live in style. Kipling's compared to the man who was, and the rest of us write with little cause, till publishers shy at talk of percents, but offer to print at author's expense. 
Oh, once the celestial fire burnt bright, and the world now calls for electric light, and Pegasus, too, is run by meter, being trolleyized to make him fleeter. So I throw the stylus away and set myself for the typewriter alphabet to spell some message I find within, which shall also scratch the rawhide skin. For you must read it, if I learn how, to write for nineteen hundred and now. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Don't You? by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Scotty Smith. When the plan which I have to grow suddenly rich grows weary of leg and drops into the ditch and scheme follows scheme like the web of a dream to glamour and glimmer and shimmer and seem only seem and then when the world looks unfadably blue if my rival sails by with his head in the sky and sings how's business why what do i do well i claim that i am to be honest and true but i sometimes lie don't you when something at home is decidedly wrong, when somebody sings a false note in the song, too low or too high, and you hardly know why, but it wrangles and jangles and runs all awry, aye, awry, and then, at the moment when things are askew, some cousin sails in, with a face all a grin, and a, do I intrude? Oh, I see that I do. Well then, though I am to be honest and true, Still, I sometimes lie, don't you? When a man whom I need has some foible or fad, not very commendable, not very bad, perhaps it's his daughter and someone has taught her to daub up an oil or streak up a water. What a water! And her grass is green, green, and her sky is blue, blue. But her father, with pride in a stagey aside, asks my candid opinion then what do I do? Well, I claim that I am to be honest and true, but I sometimes lie. Don't you? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. You Too by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Tavarish did you ever make some small success and brag your little brag as if your breathing would impress the world and fix your tag upon it so that all might see the label loudly reading me and when you thought you'd gained the height and sunning in your own delight you preened your plumes and crowed all right did something wipe you out of sight unless you did this many a time you needn't stop to read this rhyme when I was Mama's little joy, and not the least bit tough, I'd sometimes whop some other boy, if he were small enough, and for a week I'd wear a chip, and at the uplift of a lip I'd lord it like a pygmy pope, until, when I had run my rope, some bullet-headed little swope would clean me out as slick as soap. No doubt you were as bad or worse, or else you had not read this verse. All women were like pica print when I was young and wise. I'd read their very souls by dint of looking in their eyes. And in those limpid souls I'd see a very fierce regard for me. And then, my, my, it makes me faint peroxide and a pinkish paint gave me the hard, hard heart complaint I saw the sham, I felt the taint. Yet if she'd pat me once or twice, I'd follow like a little fice. I never played a little game and won a five or ten, but presto, I was not the same as common makes of men. Not Solomon and all his kind held half the wisdom of my mind. And so I'd swell to twice my size, and throw my hat across my eyes, and chew a quill, and wear red ties, and tip you off the stock to rise, until at last I'd have to steal the baby's bank 
to buy a meal. I speak as if these things remained all in the perfect tense, and yet I don't suppose I've gained a single ounce of sense. I scoff these tales of yesterday in quite a supercilious way, but by tomorrow I may bump into some newer game and jump. You'll think I am the only trump in all the deck until slump, unless you'll do the same sometime. Of course, you haven't read this rhyme. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Eternal Every Day by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 29th of November, 2016, Kent Oh, one might be like Socrates and lift the hemlock up, Pledge death with philosophic ease and drain the untrembling cup. But to be barefoot and be great, most in desert and least in state, servant of truth and lord of fate. I own I falter at the peak, trod daily by the steadfast Greek. O oh, one might nerve himself to climb, his cross and cruelly die, forgiving his betrayer's crime with pity in his eye. But day by day and week by week to feel his power and yet be meek, Endure the curse and turn the cheek. I scarce dare trust even you to be, As was the Jew of Galilee. O oh, one might reach heroic heights By one strong burst of power. He might endure the whitest lights Of heaven for an hour. But harder is the daily drag To smile at trials with fret and fag, And not to murmur nor to lag. The test of greatness is the way one meets the eternal every day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Don't Take Your Troubles to Bed by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 29th of November 2016, Kent You may labour your fill, friend of mine, if you will. You may worry a bit, if you must. You may treat your affairs as a series of cares. You may live on a scrap and a crust. But when the day's done, put it out of your head. Don't take your troubles to bed. You may batter your way through the thick of the fray. You may sweat, you must swear, you may grunt. You may be a jack fool if you must, but this rule should ever be kept at the front. Don't fight with your pillow, but lay down your head and kick every worriment out of the bed. That friend or that foe, which he is, I don't know, whose name we have spoken as death, hovers close to your side while you run or you ride, and he envies the warmth of your breath. But he turns him away with a shake of his head when he finds that you don't take your troubles to bed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Failure by Edward Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 29th of November, 2016, Kent What is failure? It's only a spur To a man who receives it right And it makes the spirit within him stir To go in once more and fight if you never have failed, it's an even guess. You never have won a high success. What is a miss? It's a practice shot which a man must make to enter. The list of those who can hit the spot 
of the bull's eye in the centre. If you never have sent your bullet wide, you never have put a mark inside. What is a knockdown? A count of ten, which a man may take for a rest. It will give him a chance to come up again and do his particular best. If you never have more than met your match, I guess you never have towed the scratch. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Good by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. You look at yourself in the glass and say, Really, I'm rather Daston Gay. To be sure, my eyes are assorted in size, and my mouth is a crack running too far back, and I hardly suppose an unclassified nose is a mark of beauty as beauty goes. But still there's something about the whole, suggesting a beauty of, well, say soul. And this is the reason that photograph galleries are able to pay employees' salaries. Now this little mark of our brotherhood, by which each thinks that his looks are good, is laudable, quite, in you and me, provided we not only look, but be. I look at my poem, and you hear me say, Really, it's clever in its way. The theme is old, and the style is cold. These words run rude, that line is crude. And here is a rhyme which fails to chime, and the meter dances out of time. Oh, it isn't so bright it'll blind the sun, but it's better than that by such a one. And this is the reason I and my creditors curse the unreasoning whims of editors. And yet, if one writes for a livelihood, he ought to believe that his work is good, provided the form that his vanity takes not only believes, but also makes. And there is our neighbor. We've heard him say, Really, I'm not the commonest clay. Brown got his dust by betraying a trust, and Jones's wife leads a terrible life. While I have heard that Robinson's word isn't quite so good as gas preferred. And Smith has a soul with seamy cracks, for he talks of people behind their backs. And these are the reasons the penitentiary holds open house for another century. True, we want no man in our neighborhood who doesn't consider his character good. But then it ought to be also true he not only knows to consider, but do. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Let's be glad we're living by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Oh, let's be glad that we're living yet. You bet. The sun runs round, and the rain is wet, and the bird flip-flops its wing. Tennis and toil bring an equal sweat. It's so much trouble to frown and fret, so easy to laugh and sing. Ting-ling, so easy to laugh and sing. And yet sometimes when I sing my song, I'm almost afraid my method is wrong. Many have money, which I have not, God what, but little and keep are all they've got, and the stars still dot the sky. Heaven be praised that they shine so bright, heaven be praised for an appetite. So who is richer than I, hi yi say, who is richer than I? And yet I'm hoping to sell this screed, for several dollars I hardly need. Ducats and dividends, stocks and shares, who cares? Worry and property travel in pairs, while the green grows on the tree. A banquet's nothing more than a meal, a trolley's much like an automobile. 
with a transfer sometimes free tralee with a transfer sometimes free and yet you're unwilling i plainly see to leave the automobile to me a note you give and a note you get don't fret for they both may go to protest yet and the roses blow perfume fortune is only a done report the homestead law and the bankrupt court have fostered many a boom 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 have fostered many a boom but i see you smile in a rapturous way on the man who is rated double a life is a show for you and me it's free and what you look for is what you see a hill is a humped-up hollow riches are yours with a dollar bill a million's the same little digit still with nothing but knots to follow so hollow there's nothing but knots to follow but you and i as i've said before could get along with a trifle more end of poem this recording is in the public domain success by edmund vance cook read for LibriVox.org by bruce kachuk it's little the difference where you arrive the serious question is how you strive are you up to your eyes in a wild romance does your lady lead you a dallying dance do you question if love be fate or chance oh the world will ask did he get the girl though gentleman coxcomb clown or churl master or menial of passion's whirl but it isn't that the world will run though you never bequeath it daughter or son but what o oh lover will come to you if you be not chivalrous honest true as far ahead as a man may think you can see your little soul shrivel and shrink it's not do you win it is what have you been are you stripped for the world-old world-wide race for the metal which shines like the sun's own face till it dazzles us blind to the mean and base do you say to yourself when i have my hoard i will give of the plenty which i have stored if the lord bless me i will bless the lord and do you forget as you pile your pelf what is the gift you are giving yourself though your mountain of gold may dazzle the day can you climb its height with your feet of clay oh it isn't the stamp on the metal you win it's the stamp on the metal you coin within it's not what you give it is what do you live are you going to sail the polar seas to the point of ninety and north degrees where the very words in your larynx freeze well the mob may ask did he reach the pole though fair or foul did he touch the goal but if that be the spirit which stirs your soul off off from the land below the zeros for you are not of the stuff of heroes ho many a man can lead men forth to the fearsome end of the farthest north but can you be faithful for woe or weal in a land where nothing but self is leal oh it isn't how far it is what you are and it isn't your lookout where you arrive but it's up to you as to how you strive end of poem this recording is in the public domain the grill 
by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Why do you? What's it to you? I know you do, for I've seen the gruesome feeling simmer through you. I've seen it rise behind your eyes and take your features by surprise. I've seen it in your half-hid grin and the tilting upness of your chin. Good-natured though you are and fair, as you have often boasted, still you like to hear the other man artistically roasted. Whenever the star secures the stage with the spotlight in the center, why should the anvil chorus think it has the cue to enter? Whenever the prima donna trills the E above the clef, why should the brasses orchestrate the bass in double F? It's funny, but it's even money. You like to spy the buzzing fly in the other fellow's honey. Though you have said that honest bread demands no honey on its spread, and if we eat the crusty wheat with appetite, it needs no sweet, still I have noticed you were not at all inclined to cry, because the man the bees had blessed was bothered with the fly. Whenever the chef concocts a dish which sets the world to tasting, why does the cooking school get out its recipes for basting? Whenever a sprinter beats the bunch from the pistol shot, why is it the heavy hammer throwers get together for a visit? Excuse me, did you accuse me of turning the spit a little bit myself? Why, you amuse me. Didn't I scratch the sulphurous match and blow the flame to make it catch? Didn't you trot to get the pot to heat the water good and hot? Then, seizing on our victim, if we found no greater sin, didn't we call him a lobster and cheerfully chuck him in? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Vision by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway. 29th of November, 2016. Kent. At the door of success, I've been tempted to knock both the door and the man who went through it. But I find that the fellow was greasing the lock all the time that he strove to undo it. So I either stay out or must look for the key which slipped back the bolt which impeded. And I'm certain to find it as soon as I see the reason my rival succeeded. Yes, I own when the man is a rank also ran, that I feel quite pish tushy and pooey, and exclaim if he ever knew sawdust from bran, well, I'll come from just west of St. Louis. But then in the winning he's made, there's a hope that I may do even as he did. So I swallow my sneer and I study his dope to discover just why he succeeded. I've been up in the air, I've been down in the hole, but always let's hope on the level. And I've been on my uppers, so meagre my soul, twould scarcely have tempted the devil. But it's nothing to you what I am or I was, and no wit of your sympathies needed, for I'm certain to win in the long run because I shall see how my rival succeeded. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Blood is Red by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway. 29th of November, 2016. Kent. Some of us don't drink. Some of us do. Some of us use a word or two. Most of us, maybe, are halfway ripe for deeds that wouldn't look well in type. All of us have done things, no doubt, we don't very often brag about. 
we are timidly good, we are badly bold, but there's hope for the worst of us, I hold. If there be a few things we didn't do, for the reason that we so wanted to. Some of us sin on a smaller scale. We don't mind minnows, we shy at a whale. We speak of a woman with half a sneer. We sit on our hands when we ought to cheer. The salad we mix in the bowl of the heart, we sometimes make a little too tart for home consumption. We growl, we nag, but we're not quite lost if we sometimes drag the hot words back and make them mild at the moment they fret to be running wild. Don't pin your faith on the man or woman who never is tempted. We're mostly human. And whoever he be who never has felt the red blood sing in the veins and melt, the ice of convention, caste and creed, to the very last barrier has no need to raise his brows at the rest of us. It bides its time in the best of us, and well for him if he do not do that which the strength of him wants him to. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Diagnosis by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 29th of November 2016 Kent You have a grudge against the man Who did the thing you couldn't do You hatched the scheme, you laid the plan And yet you couldn't push it through You strained your soul and couldn't win He gave a breath and it was easy you smile and swallow your chagrin, but oh, the swallow makes you queasy. I know your illness, for you see, the diet never pleases me. Your dearest friend has made a strike, has placed his mark above the crowd, has won the thing which you would like, and you are glad for him and proud. Your tongue is swift, your cheek is red, if someone speak to his detraction, and yet the fact the thing is said affords you half a satisfaction. I see the workings of your mind because my own is so inclined. You tell me fame is hollow squeak, you say that wealth is carking care, and to live carefree a single week is more than years of work and wear. Alexander weeps his highest place. Diogenes is happy sunny. What matters is who wins the race. So you have had the joy of running. And yet to covet prize and pelf. I know it for I do myself. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Spread Out by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 29th of November 2016 Kent In politics I'm a never mind And you are a I don't care But anyway I'm rather inclined To suspect we are both unfair for I have called you a coward and slave, and you have dubbed me a fool and knave. Yet perhaps I was right, for you surely abused the right of free speech in the names you used. In business you figure a profit, I guess, and I charge you as much as I dare, and I grumble that you ought to do it for less. And you ask me if my price is fair. But if I'd sold your goods and you sold mine, I doubt if the prices would much decline. Though I must insist that I think I see where well, you'd still have a little advantage of me. In religion you are a who cares what, and I am a what's the odds. So why have I sneered at your holiest thought? 
and why have you jeered at my gods? For thinking it over, I'm sure we two were doing the best that we honestly knew. Though, of course, I cannot escape a touch of suspicion that you never knew too much. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Dilettante by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 29th of November 2016 Kent To lie outright in the light of day I'm not successfully skilful But I practice a bit in an amateur way The lie that is hardly willful the society lie and the business lie, and the lie I have had to double, and the lie that I lie when I don't know why, and the truth is too much trouble. For this I am willing to take your blame, unless you have sometimes done the same. To be a fool of an A1 brand, I'm not sufficiently clever but I often have tried my prentice hand in a callow and crude endeavour. A fool with the money for which I've toiled, a fool with the word I've spoken, and the foolish fool who is fooled and foiled on a maiden's finger broken. If you never yourself have made a slip, I'm willing to watch you curl your lip. And yet my blood and my bone resist if you dub me a fool and liar. I set my teeth and double my fist and my brow is flushed with fire. You I deny and you I defy and I vow I will make you rue it. And I lie when I say I never lie which proves me a fool to do it. You may jerk your thumb at me and grin, if a liar and fool you never have been. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Conservative by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 29th of November 2016 Kent At twenty as you proudly stood And read the thesis Brotherhood If I remember right you saw The fatuous faults of social law At twenty-five you braved the storm And dug the trenches of reform Stung by some gadfly in your breast Which would not let your spirits rest at thirty-five you made a pause to sum the columns of the cause. You noted with unwilling eye the heedless world had passed you by. At forty you had always known man owns a duty to his own. Man's life is as man's life is made. The game is fair if fairly played. At fifty after years of stress you bore the banner of success. All men have virtues, all have sins, and God is with the man who wins. At sixty from your captured heights, you fly the flag of vested rights, bounded by bonds collectible and hopelessly respectable. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hush by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Tavarish What's the best thing that you ever have done? The whitest day, the cleverest play That ever you set in the shine of the sun? The time that you felt just a wee bit proud Of defying the cry of the cowardly crowd And stood back to back with God? I, I notice you nod but silence yourself, lest you bring me shame that I have no answering deed to name. What's the worst thing that ever you did? The darkest spot, the blackest blot on the page, 
you have pasted together and hid. Ah, sometimes you think you've forgotten it quite, till it crawls in your bed in the dead of the night, and brands you its own with a blush. What was it? Nay, hush. Don't tell it to me, for fear it be known, that I have an answering blush of my own. But whenever you notice a clean hit made, sing high and clear the sounding cheer you would gladly have heard for the play you played. And when a man walks in the way forbidden, think you of the thing you have happily hidden, and spare him the sting of your tongue. Do I do that, which I've sung? Well, it may be I don't, and maybe I do, but I'm telling the thing which is good for you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Island by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Tavarish you, my friend, in your long-tailed coat, with your white cravat at your withered throat, praying by proxy of him you hire, worshipping God with a quartered choir, bumping your head on the pew in front, assenting Amen, with an anxious grunt. Are you sure it is you in the pew? Look, you're away on a lonely isle, where the scant breech clout is the only style, where the day of the week forgets its name, where God and devil are all the same. Look at yourself in your careless clout, and tell me, then, would you be devout? One on the island, one in the pew. How do you know which is you? You, dear maiden, with eyes askance, at the little sobrette and her daring dance, thanking God that his ways are wide to allow you to pass on the other side. You, as you ask, will the world approve at the hint of a wabble out of the groove? Look, on that isle of the lonely sea are you, the saucy sobrette and he and the little grooves that you circle in are forever as though they never had been. Now you're naked of soul and limb. Will you say what you will not dare for him? Which of the women is real, the one you appear or the one you feel? You, good sir, with your neck a stretch as the van goes by with the prison wretch, asking not of his ills or hurts, judging his getting his just deserts, pluming yourself that the moral laws are centred in you as effect in cause. Look at the island, and there you are, with the long strong arm which reaches far. And there are the natives who kneel and bow, and where are your melm at tomb now? Are you sure that the balance swings quite true, or does it a little incline to you? Answer or not, as you will, but, oh, I have an island too, and so, I know, I know. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Humbler Heroes by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Scotty Smith It might not be so difficult to lead the light brigade While the army cheered behind you and the fifes and bugles played It might be rather easy with the war shriek in your ears To forget the bite of bullets and the taste of blood and tears But to be a scrub woman with four babies or more, every day, every day, setting your back on the rack, and all your reward forever, not quite a full bite of bread for your babies. Say, in the heat of the day, you might be a hero to head a brigade. But a hero like her? I'm afraid. I'm afraid.
it might be very feasible to force a great reform to saddle public passion and to ride upon the storm it might be somewhat simple to ignore the roar of wrath because a second shout broke out to cheer you on your path but he who alone and unknown is true to his view unswerved by the crush of the mutton-browed blatting crowd unwon by the flabby-brained blinking ease which he sees throned and anointed say at the height of the fray you might be the chosen to captain the throng but to stand all alone how long how long end of poem this recording is in the public domain Conscience Pianissimo by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk You are honest as daylight. You're often assured that your word is as good as your note, unsecured. We could trust you with millions unaudited. But, tut tut, there is always a but, so don't get excited. I'm pained to perceive. It is seldom I notice you grumble or grieve when the custom house officer pockets your tip and passes the contraband goods in your grip. You would scorn to be shy on your ante, I'm certain, but skinning your uncle you're rather expert in. While I'm proud that no taint of the sort touches me, for I've never been over the water, you see. Your yardstick's a yard, and your goods are all wool your bushels four pecks and you measure it full you are proud of your business integrity yet don't fret there is always a yet i never have noticed a sign of distress or disturbance in you when the upright assessor has listed your property somewhere about half what you would take were you selling it out you're as true to the world as the world to its axis but you chuckle to swear off your personal taxes. As for me, I would scorn to do any such thing, though I may have considered the question last spring. You have notions of right. You would count it a sin to cheat a blind billionaire out of a pin. You have a contempt for a pettiness. Still, don't chill, there is always a still. I never have noticed you storm with neglect because the conductor had failed to collect, or growl that the game wasn't run on the square, when your boy in the high school paid only half fare. The voice of your conscience is lusty and audible, but a railroad, good heavens, why, that's only laudable. Of course, I am quite in a different class. For me, it is painful to ride on a pass. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The World Runs On by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. So many good people find fault with God, though admitting he's doing the best he can but still they consider it somewhat odd that he doesn't consult them concerning his plan. But the sun sinks down, and the sun climbs back, and the world runs round and round its track. Or they say God doesn't precisely steer this world in the way they think is best. And if he would listen to them, he'd veer a hair to the sow or sow west by west. But the world sails on, and it never turns back, and the mariner never makes attack. Or the same folk pray, Ho, oh, if thou please, dear God, be a little more circumspect. Thou knowest thy worm, who is on his knees, would not willingly charge thee with neglect. But, oh, if indeed thou knowest all things, why fittest thou not thy worm with wings? So many good people are quite inclined to favor God with their best advices, and consider there's something more than kind in helping him out of critical crises. But the world runs on as it ran before, and eternally shall run evermore. 
so many people like you and me are deeply concerned for the sins of others and conceive it their duty that god should be apprised of the lack in erring brothers and the myriad sun stars need the skies and look at us out of their calm clear eyes End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pass by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Did somebody give you a pat on the back? Pass it on. Let somebody else have a taste of the snack. Pass it on. If it heightens your courage, or lightens your pack, if it kisses your soul with a song in the smack, maybe somebody else has been dressing in black. Pass it on. God gives you a smile, not to make it a yawn. Pass it on. Did somebody show you a slanderous mess? Pass it by. When a brook's flowing by, will you drink at the cess? Pass it by. Dame gossip's a wanton, whatever her dress. Her sire was a lie, and her dam was a guess, and a poison is in her polluting caress. Pass it by. Unless you're a porker, keep out of the sty. Pass it by. Did somebody give you an insolent word? Pass it up. Tis the creak of a cricket, the pwit of a bird. Pass it up. Shake your fist at the sea, is its majesty blurred? Blow your breath at the sky, is its purity slurred? But the shallowest puddle, how easily stirred! Pass it up. Does the puddle invite you to dip in your cup? Pass it up. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Publicity by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. There's nothing like publicity to further that lubricity which minted cartwheels need to maximize their speed in your direction. True, some hydropathist of stocks or one whose trade is picking locks may make objection. Yet even those gentry always lurk where booming first has done its work. Observe how oft some foreigner, about the size of coroner, can sell L-O-R-D for letters, as you see, for seven numbers, because his trademark, thus devised, is advertised and advertised, till it encumbers the mental view, as though twere some bald-headed brand of chewing gum study your own psychology see how some mere tautology of picture or of print has realized the glint of your good money how often have persistent views of one bare head sold you your shoes which does seem funny and yet twas head work after all which helped the shoe man make his haul there's some obscure locality in every man's mentality, which, I am free to state, I'd like to penetrate, for my felicity. For now, who gives a second look, when he perceives a poem by Cook? But come publicity, and then a poem by Cook were seen, the first thing in the magazine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Move by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. We are on the main line of a crowded track. We've got to go forward. We can't go back and run the risk of colliding. We must make schedule, not now and again, but always, forever and ever. Amen. Or else switch off on a siding. If ever we loaf, like a car in the yard, doesn't somebody bump us and bump us hard? I wonder. 
you've succeeded in building a pretty fair trade but can you sit down in the grateful shade and kill time cutting up capers or must you hustle and scheme and sweat though the shine be fine or the weather be wet and keep your page in the papers if ever you fail to be pulling the strings aren't some of your rivals around doing things i wonder you're a first-class salesman you know your line your house is good and your goods are fine so you fill your book with orders but can you get quit of the ball and chain or are you in jail on a railroad train with blue-coated men for warders if you sent your samples and cut out the trip wouldn't somebody else soon be lugging your grip i wonder you are starred on the bills and are chummy with fame the man on the corner could tell you your name at three o'clock in the morning but can you depend on the mind of the mob can you tell your press agent to look for a job or give your manager warning should you lie down to sleep with your laurels beneath wouldn't somebody else soon be wearing your wreath i wonder oh i'm willing to work but i wish i could lag not feeling as if i were it for tag or last in follow my leader there is only one spot where i haven't a doubt nobody will try to be crowding me out and that is under the cedar and even in that place will gabriel's trump come nagging along and be making me jump i wonder End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Get Next by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Chapter 1, verse 1 is where you'll find the text of what is in my mind, if haply you are so inclined chapter one verse one the primal rule for saint or sinner sage or fool no matter what his church or school though you may call it slangy solely though you may term it flippant wholly truth still is truth and is not vexed i write this rhyme to prove the text get next suppose i sought some lonely height and dipped a stylus in the light of welding words and sought to write upon the highest deepest blue my message to sam smith and you the chances are it would not do you would not risk your neck to read my much too altitudinous screed and i chagrined and half perplexed had missed you when i missed my text get next suppose you have a breakfast food which you conceive i should include within my lat and longitude tis not enough to have the stuff but you must post and praise and puff until i memo on my cuff among my most important notes be sure to bring home oatless oats and then you know that i'm a next because you followed out the text get next get next get next and hold it true there's one you must get next us to and that important one is you be not of those who uncommuned with their own skins have all but swooned from some imaginary wound but strip the rags from off your soul and find you are not maimed but whole tis but a flea bite which has vexed as soon as you've applied the text get next end of poem this recording is in the public domain are you you by edmund vance cook read for librivox.org by tavarish are you a trailer or are you a trolley are you tagged to a leader through wisdom and folly are you somebody else 
or you? Do you vote by the symbol and swallow it straight? Do you pray by the book? Do you pay by the rate? Do you tie your cravat by the calendar's date? Do you follow a cue? Are you a writer or that which is worded? Are you a shepherd or one of the herded? Which are you, a what or a who? It sounds well to call yourself one of the flock, but a sheep is a sheep after all. At the block you are nothing but mutton, or possibly stock. Would you flavor a stew? Are you a being and boss of your soul? Or are you a mummy to carry a scroll? Are you somebody else or you? When you finally pass to the heavenly wicked, where Peter the Scrutinous stands on his picket, are you going to give him a blank for a ticket? Do you think it will do? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Price by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson in or under or over the earth what will fill you and what suffice no matter how mean or how much it's worth it is yours if you pay the price never a thing may a man attain but gain pays loss or loss pays gain lady of riches riot and rout fair of flesh and sated of sense nothing in life you need do without except the trifle of innocence counterfeit kisses you paid and got just what you paid for, which is what? Man of adroitness, place and power, trampled above and torn below, set in the light of your noonday hour, playing a part in the public show, fooling the mob that the mob may be ruled. You know which is the greater fooled. Artist of pencil or paint or pen, reed or string or the vocal note, making the soul to suffer again and the wild heart clutch the throat. Ever your fancy has paid, in fact, you rack my soul as yours was racked. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Bubble Flies by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Let me read a homily concerning an anomaly I view in you. Whatever you are striving for, whatever you are driving for, tis not alone because you crave to be successful that you slave, to swim upon the topmost wave. You care less what your station is, but more what your relation is, to be a bit above the rest, to be upon or of the crest. Ah, that is where the trouble lies which stirs you little bubble flies i sneer these sneers but just the same i keep my fingers in the game see you have eat and drinkables and portables and thinkables and yet you fret for what let's reach the heart of you and see the funny part of you for what i find the soul and seed of it is not your lack or need or even merely vulgar greed gold you may have a store of it but someone else has more of it fame pretty things are said of you but someone is ahead of you place you disprise your easy one for someone's high and breezy one i smile these smiles to soothe my soul but squint one eye upon the goal tell me what's your capacity compared to your veracity i guess tis less and so i strike these attitudes and tender you these platitudes not wishing wealth or spurning it not hoarding it or burning it is equal to the earning it life's race is in the riding it not in the word deciding it and after all is said and uttered the keenest taste is bread and buttered and yet and yet my palate aches for pallid pie and pasty cakes end of poem this recording is in the public domain Qualified by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Betty B. I love to see my friends succeed. 
i love to praise him yes indeed and so no doubt do you but will you tell me why it is the praise we parcel out as his so often goes askew and ends by running in the rut of if except or but boggs is a clever chap his trade is doubling yearly and he's made a fortune all right but sharp is elected well i say he'll hit a high mark yet some day if here one eye is shut such acting why i laughed and wept fob's art is great except miss houghton has such queenly grace and then her figure and her face she'd be a beauty if and mrs fallall entertains with so much taste and so much pains but here a little sniff and mrs cast has ever kept the narrow path except i wish some man were great and good that i might praise him all i could and never add a but i would that some would value me and never hint what i would be if but why cavil tut eternal justice still is kept and heaven is good except end of poem this recording is in the public domain what are you doing by edmund vance cook read for librivox dot org by betty b what are you doing do you lazily nurse your knee and muse do you contemplate your conquering thews with a critical satisfaction but yesterday's laurels are dry and dead and tomorrow's triumph is still ahead to-day is the day for action yesterday's sun is it shining still to-morrow's dawn will its coming fill to-day if to-day's light fail us not so the past is for ever past to-day's is the hand which holds us fast and to-morrow may never hail us the present and only the present endures so it's hay for to-day for to-day is yours for the goal you are still pursuing what you have done is a little amount what you will do is of lesser account but the test is what are you doing end of poem this recording is in the public domain the first person singular by edmund vance cook read for librivox dot org by betty b mcumphrey's a fellow who's lengthy on lungs backed up by the smoothest of ball-bearing tongues and his topic himself is worth talking about but he works it so much he has frazzled it out he never will give me my half of a chance to chip in my own little clever romance in the first person singular yes and they say he offended you too in a similar way cousin maud tells her illnesses ancient and recent in a most minute way which is almost indecent vivisecting herself with some medical chatter she serves us her portions as if on a platter never noting how i am but waiting to stir my dregs of diseases to offer to her and i hear such a joke that your chronic gastritis stands silent forever before her nephritis mrs henderson's annie goes out every night and bertha before her was simply a fright while agnes broke more than the worth of her head and maggie well some things are better unsaid such manners to talk of her help when she knows my wife's simply aching to tell of our woes and i hear that she never lets you get a start on your story of rosie we all know by heart you'd hardly believe that i've heard bunsen tell the flea powder frenchman and razors to sell the one-legged goose and that old what you please and even i swear it the crow and the cheese and he sprang that old yarn of he said twas his leg when you wanted to tell him columbus's egg well i wanted to tell my own whimsical tale which i recently wrote of the man in the whale end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Choice by Edmund Vance Cook, read for LibriVox by Colin Higgins, New York. The little it takes to make life bright, if we open our eyes to get it, and the trifle which makes it black as night, if we close our lids and let it. Behold as the world goes whirling by, 
it is gloomy or glad as fits your eye. As it fits your eye, and I mean by that, you find what you look for mostly. You can feed your happiness full of fat. You can make your miseries ghostly. Or you can forget every joy you own by coveting something beyond your zone. In the storms of life we can fret the eye, where the guttering mud is drifted. Or we can look to the worldwide sky, where the artist's scenes are shifted. Puddles are oceans in miniatures, or merely puddles, the choice is yours. We can strip our niggardly souls so bare that we haggle a penny between us, or we can be rich in a common share of the Pleiades and Venus. You can lift your soul to its outermost look, or can keep it packed in a pocketbook. We may follow a phantom the arid miles to a mountain of cankered treasure, or we can find in a baby's smiles the pulse of a living pleasure. We may drink of the sea until we burst, while the trickling spring would have quenched our thirst. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Saving Clause by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Kerr wrote a book, and a good book, too. At least I managed to read it through without finding very much room for blame. And a good many other folks did the same. But when anyone asked me, Have you read? or How did you like? I only said, Very good, very good. And I'm glad enough, for his other writings are horrible stuff. Banks wrote a reply, and it had a run. That's a good deal more than ever I've done. The interest held with hardly a lag, from the overture to the final tag. But when anyone asked me, Have you seen, or what do you think? I looked serene and remarked, Oh, a pretty good thing of its kind, but I guess Mr. Shakespeare needn't mind. Phelps made a machine. T'was smooth as grease. I couldn't invent its smallest piece in a thousand years. It was tried and tried until everybody was satisfied. But when anyone asked me, Will it pay? Is it really good? I could only say, It's a marvelous thing. Why, it almost thinks. And Phelps is a wonder. Too bad he drinks. Errata. On scanning the verses through, I find these pronouns should all read you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Between Two Thieves by Edmund Vance Cook, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Sure. I am one who disbelieves in thieves, at which you interrupt to cry, I, I, and I. Humph, you are so sudden to agree. Suppose we see. I know a thief, no matter whether I ought to know a thief or not. Perhaps we went to school together. That old excuse has worked a lot. One day he copped a rummy's leather, which means, I hate to tell you what, it's such a vulgar thing to steal, a drunkard's purse to buy a meal. Hey, pal, said he, come help me dine. I've hit a pit and got the swag. Today Delmonico's is mine. Tomorrow once again a vag. Come on and tell me all the stunts of all the boys who knew me once. Did I go with him? I did not. Would you have gone? Could you be bought by dinners when the trail was hot? And any hour he might be caught. I know a thief whose operations are colored by a kindly law. Your income and a beggar's rations contribute to his cunning claw. Cities and counties, courts and nations pay portion to his monstrous maw. He gave a dinner not long since in honor of some played-out prince. The decorations, ah, how chaste! And how delicious was the wine! For Mrs. Thief has perfect taste, and Mr. Thief knows how to dine. 
and so the world has long agreed quite to forgive forget and feed but really i was shocked to see how many decent folks could be induced to come and bow the knee i think you were my vis-a-vis -vis. yes yes i quite despise him too like you and though it's not a thing to brag i somehow like the vag but oh the difference one perceives between two thieves end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Spectator by Edmund Vance Cook, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Look at the man with the crown weighing him down, plumed and petted, galled and fretted. Why do you eye him askance with a quiver of hate in your glance? Why not conceive him as human, nursed at the breast of a woman, growing mayhap as he could, not as he would? How are you sure that you would be better and wiser than he? Look at the woman whose eye follows you by, silked and satined, scented and fattened. Why does your half-smile slip into a sneer on your lip? You pity her? Ah, but the fashion of your complacent compassion. Pity her, yet you have said, better the creature were dead. What is there left here for her but to err? Thus would you make the world right, hiding its ills from your sight. Look at the man with a pack breaking his back, ragged, squalid, wretched, stolid, and you are sorry, you say, much as you are at play. But do you say to him, Brother, twin, born son of our mother, what were the word or deed fitting your need? Or as he slouches by, do you breathe, God be praised, I am I? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Squealer by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Of course, some people are born so bright that no matter what one may say or write, the theme is old and the lesson is trite, which is what you may say as these lines unreal, and I mildly suggest it is better to feel than to squeal. Everybody knows that? Yes, it's certain they do. Everybody, that is, with exception of two, of whom I am one and the other is you. But for us the lesson is still remote, although we commit it and cite it and quote it by rote. But still when you thrill with the thudding thump from the fist of the fellow you tried to bump, and the world looks hard at the swelling lump, there's a strong temptation to open your door and invite the public to hear you roar that you're sore. And again, though tis plain as the printed page, keep your hand on the lever and watch the gauge when the fire pot's full and the boilers rage. How often the steam pressure grows and grows, and before the engineer cares or knows, up she goes. So why should you fret if I send you to school again to consider the sapient rule that wisdom is silence? and speech is a fool close up and a year from today you will kneel and thank the good lord that you knew how to feel and not squeal end of poem this recording is in the public domain distance and disenchantment by Edmund Vance Cook, read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. He was playing New York, and on Broadway at that, I was playing in stock in Chicago. I heard that his Hamlet fell fearfully flat. He heard I was fierce as Iago. Each looked to the other exceedingly small. We were too far apart. That is all. 
you too if your vision is ever reflective have noticed your rival is small in perspective i heard him in memphis a chance matinee he heard me one sunday in dallas his critics i swore never witnessed the play he vowed mine were prompted by malice a pleasanter fellow i cannot recall we were closer together that's all and your rival too if you once see him clearly is clever or how could he rival you nearly in seattle they said he was greater than booth or in portland perhaps i've forgotten i said twas ungracious to speak the plain truth but his work in the first act was rotten i had only intended to speak of the thrall of his wonderful fifth act that's all but when a man's praised far ahead of his talents i guess you say something to even the balance in atlanta i heard a remark that he made and again in mobile alabama that he hardly thought shakespeare was meant to be played like a ten twenty third melodrama oh well there was one honey drop in the gall the fellow was jealous that's all and you too have found when a friendship is broken that his words are worse than the ones you have spoken End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Family Resemblance by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. I used to boost the PNP, designed to run from sea to sea, from Portland or to Portland me, but which, as all the maps agree, begins somewhere in minnesota and peters out in north dakota you jibed because i used to mock its streaks of rust and rolling stock its schedule and its gpa who took your annual away but lately you seem much inclined to own a sudden change of mind ah me you're much like other folks i see i much admired the book reviews of quillip of the daily news i laughed to see him put the screws on some sprig of the late who's who's tear off his verbiage and skin him to show the little there was in him you said the book he wrote himself lay stranded on the dealer's shelf and wasn't worthy a critique just what he said of mine last week perhaps your reasoning was strong and you were right and i was wrong hi ho i'm very much like you i know o'brien's zeal ran almost daft in its antipathy to graft he raked the practice fore and aft lord how his sulphurous breath would waft eternal and infernal torment to every grasping grafting varmint the worst of these upon the planet he said were those who wanted granite in public buildings yes begory o'brien owns a sandstone quarry of course i'd hate to see it tested but would he be less interested in civic virtue uninvested oh dear o'brien's much like us i fear End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Need by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Don't you remember how you and I held a property nobody wanted to buy in San Jose? Until one day a man came along from Franklin, PA and didn't we jump till we happened to find the chap wasn't going it wholly blind but all the rest of the block was bought and he simply had to have our lot well didn't our land go up in price till double the figures would scarce suffice and don't we sometimes figure and fret how he got the best of us even yet 
don't you remember the perfect plan you had which needed another man to make it win to jump right in and everlasting make things spin and you said i had the requisite dash and also the trifle of hoarded cash was i glad to get in well yes indeed until i saw the compelling need which had brought you to me and then ho ho none of that for me nay not for joe and i'm always provoked when i think you made the plan get along without my aid don't you remember the time we met at des moines or was it at winterset but anyway you were feeling blue and tickled to see me through and through and come let's open a bottle of ink said you and see if it's good to drink but weren't you sorry because you spoke when i had to tell you i was broke oh you lent me the sawbuck i know but still i fancied your ardor had taken a chill and you've never been able to quite forget that once i was broke and in your debt end of poem this recording is in the public domain better by edmund vance cook read for LibriVox.org by bruce kachuk there's only one motto you need to succeed better the other man's winning then you must do better from the baking of bread to the breaking ahead from rhyming a ballad to slimming a salad from mending of ditches to spending of riches follow the rule to the uttermost letter better of course you may say but a few can do better and you're going to strive so that all may thrive better and it's right you are to follow the star set in the heavens afar afar but still with your eyes on the skies it is wise to be riding a mule or guiding a school thatching a hovel or hatching a novel foretelling weather or selling shoe leather and remember you must be doing it just a wee dust better and tis quite as right for you to cite that the author might or ought to write a heavenly sight better for which sharp word i am much your debtor knowing none other could file my fetter better end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Forget What the Other Man Hath by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 29th of November 2016 Kent What do I care for your four-track line? I have a country path, and this is the message I've taken for mine, forget what the other man hath. What do I care for your giant trees? I'd rather whittle a lath, and my motto helps me to take my ease, forget what the other man hath. What do I care for your Newport beach? A tub's as good for a bath. And I'll keep my solace in constant reach, forget what the other man hath. What do I care for your automobile? I'm saving repairs and wrath. My proverb goes well with an old style will, forget what the other man hath. What do I care if you scorn my rhyme? For this is its aftermath. It sounds so well I shall try some time to forget what the other man hath. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wet by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk The day that I loaf when I ought to employ it has somehow the flavor which makes me enjoy it. So the man with no work, 
he may joyously shirk i envy no more than i do the grand turk he most is in need of a holiday who in this workaday world has no duty to do the dollar you waste when you ought not to spend it by something no plutocrat's millions could lend it for if once you exhaust all your care of the cost full half of the pleasure of purchase is lost so i trust you are one who is wise in discerning the value of spending is most in the earning my little success which was nearest complete was that which i tore from the teeth of defeat and the man who can hit with his wisdom and wit without any effort i envy no wit the genius whose laurels grow always the greenest finds pleasure in plenty but misses the keenest end of poem this recording is in the public domain what sort are you by edmund vance cook read for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. how much do you want for your a street lot said a real estate man to me i looked as if i were lost in thought and then i replied let's see blacks sold last year at fifty the foot and without using algebra that should put my figure at sixty now i guess or a trifle more or a trifle less i was anxious to sell at fifty straight or i might have been glad of forty-eight oh yes i'm a bit of a bluff it's true what sort of a bluff are you and what do you think of these railroad rates the man with a bold brow said for you have travelled through all the states and have heard a good deal and read the railroad lines i wisely replied are the lines with which our trade is tied and the wretches who take their rebates set new knots in the bonds under which we fret but now i remember i once rode free and forgot that the road rebated me oh yes i'm a bit of a bluff it's true how much of a bluff are you you've been to hear siegfried and found it fine cried a classical friend one day i'm sure your impressions accord with mine but i want your own words and way and oh their tone colour beats belief and oh dynamics and oh motif and chiaroscura how finely abstruse and oh la 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 and oh well what's the use for the only thing i understood in the play was that dippy old dragon of papier mache oh yes i'm a bit of a bluff it's true what style of a bluff are you and the senator should you believe be returned said a newspaper man to me he is as rotten a rascal as ever burned i said may i quote asked he oh no i replied if you're going to quote just remark that his friends are regretting to note that the exigencies of the party case indicate that he shouldn't re-enter the race for the senator sometimes may possibly be interviewed by a newspaper man about me no none of these cases may quite fit you but what sort of a bluff are you End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Critics by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Kathleen. As a matter of fact, I am sure I can act, and so, when I go to the show, not the art of an Irving seems wholly deserving and though booth were the star he'd have many a jar if he heard the critique which i frequently speak as you do too written deep in my heart is the knowledge of art for why i've an eye like a die and where raphael's paint has bedizened some saint i note his perspective is sadly defective and you oh i know when you've looked on corot the same blame came and the world would have gained if my voice had been trained for my ear is severe as i hear deriska and patty i've heard em sing ratty and the crowd has yelled Bzz! when a call for police should have shortened the score was there ever a more absurd word heard and i feel now and then i could handle a pen for indeed as i heed what i read i observe many faults homer nods shakespeare halts dante sad pope is trite pose mechanic holmes light 
yet so easy to do is the thing even you might write quite bright end of poem this recording is in the public domain plug by edmund vance cook read for librivox dot org by kathleen as you haven't asked me for advice i'll give it to you now plug no matter who or what you are or where you are the how is plug you may take your dictionary unabridged and con it through you may swallow the britannica and all its retinue but here i lay it f o b the only word for you is plug are you in the big procession but away behind the band plug on the cobble or asphaltum in the mud or in the sand plug oh you'll hear the story frequently of how some clever man cut clean across the country so that now he's in the van you may think that you will do it but i don't believe you can so plug are you singing in the chorus do you want to be a star plug you think that you're a genius but i don't believe you are so plug oh you'll hear of this or that one who was born without a name who slept eleven hours a day and dreamed the way to fame who simply couldn't push it off so rapidly it came but plug are you living in the valley do you want to reach the height plug where the hottest sun of day is and the coldest star of night plug oh it may be you're a fool but if a fool you want to be if you want to climb above the crowd so everyone can see just how a fool may look when he is at his apogee why plug can you make a mile a minute do you want to make it too plug are you good and up against it well the only thing to do is plug oh you'll find some marshy places where the crust is pretty thin and when you think you're gliding out you're only sliding in but the only thing for you to do is think of this and grin and plug there's many a word that's prettier that hasn't half the cheer of plug it may not save you in a day but try it for a year plug and to show you i am competent to tell you what is what i assure you that i never have made a center shot which surely is an ample demonstration that i ought to plug end of poem this recording is in the public domain familiarity breeds content by edmund vance cook read for librivox dot org by kathleen one you sometimes think you'd like to be john d and not a man you know would dare to josh you on your handsome hair oh say hey john it's rather rude to boost refined and jump on crude to help chicago university or bull the doctrine of immersity too you wouldn't care to be the pope i hope with not a chum to call your own to hail you up by telephone with say old man i hope you're free to-night bring mrs pope to tea let some one else lock up the pearly gateway to-night and get here early three perhaps you sometimes deem the czar a star with not a palm in all the land to strike his fairly hand to hand with not a man in all the pack to fetch a hand against his back and cry well met old nick come out and let us trot the kids about tut man you needn't look so pale a red flag means an auction sale four i'll bet even shakespeare's name was will until he was so dead that he was great for fame can only isolate and better than the immortal bard were hello bill and howdy pard would he have swapped his comrades laughter for all the praise of ages after end of poem this recording is in the public domain. A Song of Rest by Edmund Vance Cook Read for LibriVox.org by Kathleen I have sung the song of striving, of the struggling, of arriving, of making of one's self a horse and mounting him and driving. But now, let's cease, let's look for peace let's forget the mark of money let's forget the love of fame life is ours and skies are sunny what is worry but a name let's sit down and whiff and whittle let us loaf and laugh a little here the youngest spoiled the rhyme by running to me for a dime i have sung the joy of doing of the pleasure of pursuing and now life is like a woman and our role and rule is wooing but now oh let us cease to fret let us cease our vain desiring water's better than cliquot 
what is honour but perspiring wealth's another name for woe let us spread out in the clover just too lazy to turn over here's my wife brought in the news all the children need new shoes i have sung the song of action of the sweet of satisfaction of pounding 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 opposition to a fraction but now let's quit let's rest a bit money only makes us greedy life's success is but a taunt he alone is never needy who has learned to laugh at want let us loaf and laugh and wallow too much work to even swallow here's the mail and bills are curses i must try to sell these verses End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Desire by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. Oh, the ripe red apple which handily hung and flaunted and taunted and swayed and swung till it itched your fingers and tickled your tongue, for it was juicy and you were young but you held your hands and you turned your head and you thought of the switch which hung in the shed and you didn't take it or so you said but tell me didn't you want to oh the rounded maiden who passed you by whose cheek was dimpled whose glance was shy but who looked at you out of the tail of her eye and flirted her skirt just a trifle high oh you were human and not sedate but you thought of the narrow way and straight and you didn't follow or so you state but tell me didn't you want to oh the golden chink and the sibilant sign which sang of honey and love and wine of pleasure and power when the sun's a shine and plenty and peace in the day's decline Oh, the dream was schemed and the play was planned. You had nothing to do but to reach your hand, but you didn't. Or oh, so I understand. But tell me, didn't you want to? Oh, you wanted to, yes, and hence you crow that the want to within you found its foe, which wanted you not to want to, and so you were able to answer always no. So you tell yourself you are pretty fine clay, to have tricked temptation and turned it away. But wait, my friend, for a different day. Wait till you want to want to. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. There is oh so much by Edmund Vance Cook, read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway, twenty ninth of November, two thousand and sixteen, Kent. There is oh so much for a man to be in nineteen hundred and now. He may cover the world like the searching sea in nineteen hundred and now. He may be of the rush of the city's roar, and his song may sing where the condors soar, or may dip to the dark of Labrador in nineteen hundred and now. There is oh so much for a man to do in nineteen hundred and now. He may sort the sons of Andromeda through in nineteen hundred and now. Or he may strive as a good man must for the wretch of his feet who licks the dust and never learn how to be ever just in nineteen hundred and now. There is oh so much for a man to learn in nineteen hundred and now. The least and the most he should trouble to earn in nineteen hundred and now. The message burnt bright on the heavenly scroll, the little he needs his stomach be whole, the vastness of vision to sate his soul in nineteen hundred and now. There is oh so much for a man to get in nineteen hundred and now. He may drench the earth in vicarious sweat in nineteen hundred and now. And his wealth may be but a lifelong itch, while the lowliest digger within his ditch may have gained the little to make him rich in nineteen hundred and now. There is oh so much for a man to try in nineteen hundred and now. 
The sea is so deep, the hill is so high, in nineteen hundred and now. But sometimes we look at our little ball, where the smallest is great and the greatest is small, and wonder the why and the what of it all, in nineteen hundred and now. There is oh so much, so we work as we may, in nineteen hundred and now, and loiter a little along the way, in nineteen hundred and now. Oh, the honey bee works, but the honey bee clings to the flowers of life, and the honey bee sings. Let us eat the sweet and forget the stings in nineteen hundred and now. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. How Did You Die? by Edmund Vance Cook. Read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson did you tackle that trouble that came your way with a resolute heart and cheerful or hide your face from the light of day with a craven soul and fearful oh a trouble's a ton or a trouble's an ounce or a trouble is what you make it and it isn't the fact that you're hurt that counts but only how did you take it you are beaten to earth well well what's that come up with a smiling face it's nothing against you to fall down flat but to lie there that's disgrace the harder you're thrown why the higher you bounce be proud of your blackened eye it isn't the fact that you're licked that counts it's how did you fight and why and though you be done to death what then if you battled the best you could if you played your part in the world of men why the critic will call it good death comes with a crawl or comes with a pounce and whether he's slow or spry it isn't the fact that you're dead that counts but only how did you die end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of impertinent poems by edmund vance cook